Welcome to Dispatch from Down Under, part of the Innovation Generation webinar series to mark IP Group's 20th anniversary. In the spirit of reconciliation, IP Group Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. When IP Group Australia, sorry, when IP Group was established in the UK in 2001, nobody could have foreseen that some of the early companies we backed and supported would be centre stage in their response to a global pandemic 20 years on. Scientific innovation has proved to be a vital weapon in the response to COVID-19, and that has illustrated very effectively the importance of IP Group's work. Our purpose remains as strong today as it was then, to evolve innovation and great ideas into world-changing businesses, to support businesses that deliver a positive impact on the environment and society alongside an attractive financial return, and to bolster companies that will help tackle future global challenges. As the world seeks to rebuild from this crisis, Innovation in science and technology is likely to generate opportunities that will be critical to the fortunes of companies, countries, and the world economy. The Innovation Generation webinar series reflects on the last 20 years and looks to the future to the innovation that is set to play an important role in tomorrow's world. Today, we are pleased to present Dispatch from Down Under, the opportunity in Australia. We will first hear from Mike Molinari, the Managing Director of IP Group Australia. Mike will be followed by Ciro Perez, Head of Life Sciences, and Paul Barrett, Head of Physical Sciences. After the presentations, we have set aside time for Q&A. Please send through questions using the Q&A function as you think of them, and we will cover as many as we can at the end of the session. I will now hand over to IP Group Australia's Managing Director, Mike Molinari. Thanks, Nadan. It's a real pleasure to be joining you for this webinar to celebrate IP Group's 20th anniversary. Thank you to all of you who are joining online and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity for the Q&A at the end. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their connections to land, sea and community. As Nadine said, the format today is to give you all an introduction to the opportunity here in Australia, and in particular to the exciting emerging portfolio that we're building. You'll hear from myself, uh, Nadine, Paul and Ciro today, but I'd also like to acknowledge the team that stand behind us and who actually do all the real work. Uh, they are a fantastic team and we wouldn't be where we are today without, without them and their support. So, Australia, when I first joined IP Group in London, I was attracted by the model and the value that we had the opportunity, opportunity to create, working with the best scientists, nurturing their great ideas and building truly world-changing companies in the way that IP Group has now been doing for 20 years. At the time, it was a model that we just expanded to the US and I was conscious that there was a huge opportunity for us to do the same in Australia. We had the same building blocks, great ideas, uh, great researchers, and a real opportunity to build world-class and world-changing companies. And so it's an obvious privilege, and I'm, I'm very excited now to, have the, to, to be presenting as Managing Director of our Australian and New Zealand business. So IP Group at a glance. IP Group Australia was founded in 2017, and we're now nearly four years old. We're the third region uh, that, that IP Group established operations, and we cover Australia and New Zealand. And while we're, we are a small part today, we are a rapidly growing contributor to Group Nav. What it doesn't say on the slide, or the capture on the slide, is the level of ambition that we have for the Australian business. We're focused on building a business here over the next decade that is the scale of the UK portfolio today, and perhaps more importantly, the goal of positively impacting on the lives of a billion people around the world. There are five key components of what I wanted to touch on uh, briefly in, in my section today. One is an overview of our partners. Two, the environment that we operate here, you know, in, here in Australia. Three, our people. Fourth, our relationships with local capital. And fifth, perhaps most importantly, our portfolio and the founders and the companies who are building the companies. 
that are going to change the world. So first of all, on partners, the catalyst for launching IP Group Australia was a series of landmark partnerships uh, that we signed in 2017 with our partners at the Group of Eight and the University of Auckland. These partnerships are 20 year agreements an initial 10 years with a 10 year extension. Uh, and under those partnerships, we see all of the, the products of the great research that happens at those universities. In terms of the commitment from IP Group, we've committed to invest a minimum of 200 million Australian dollars uh, in projects arising from these universities over a 10 year period. These partnerships are unique and they build off the many years of experience that we've had in the UK in creating long-term partnerships that are win-win for all parties. And from an IP group point of view and from my point of view, the really key thing about these partnerships is that they give us from, have given us from day one access to some of the best research and the best researchers in the world and certainly the best research and researchers in Australia and New Zealand. And from day one, they've enabled us to operate at scale, seeing over 600 new invention disclosures a year. For those who might not be based in Australia and, and aren't aware, I just wanted to share perhaps a few um, numbers uh, and, and indicators of, of the scale and quality of our, of our partners here. They are all leading global universities. All nine of our partners were ranked in the top 150 in the latest QS World Rankings, eight of them in the top 100. And in aggregate, they spend over 6 billion Australian dollars a year on research. They are very large universities. So in, again, in aggregate across the nine, there are over 400,000 students, 150,000 international students, which contribute towards education uh, being one of Australia's top exports. Uh, and of those roughly 31,000 research students. And to give you a sense for, for where these universities stand in Australia and New Zealand, they are the premier universities in the regions. They have uh, educated 100% of Australia's Nobel Prize winners, and 80% of the Australian educated CEOs of our, of our top companies. They're the right partners for us, and I think they rank very well against our, our other leading university partners in the UK and in the US. In terms of the broader environment, Australia and New Zealand are great places to innovate and to build companies that are going to change the world. We boast in Australia a very, and New Zealand, a very entrepreneurial and can-do culture, and that's reflected in rankings in various surveys. Uh, we're number one for technological readiness in a 2018 Economist Intelligence Unit, Unit, Economist Intelligence Unit study, uh, and number six for global entrepreneurship. And when you look at the population, uh, we have an incredibly highly educated population. 40% of our, 47% of our workforce uh, has tertiary qualifications. So against this backdrop of, a, of an entrepreneurial culture and an entrepreneurial history, uh, we also have a lot of support and backing from government to support translation and commercialization of research and early stage development. Notably, the R&D tax incentive here in Australia provides for 43.5% refund uh, cash refundable for eligible R&D expenditures. Uh, medical research in the country and translation of medical research is backed by the Medical Research Future Fund. Uh, which is a, a tremendous vehicle uh, set up by the federal government. It's a $20 billion long-term investment to support and, and encourage translation of, of medical research. And in the physical sciences, we have Accelerating Commercialisation, which is another program uh, roughly analogous to Innovate UK, for those of you who are, who are familiar with that environment. Outside of the programs that I've got on the slide there, there are two others that I, that I would flag. One is the effort, current effort by the federal government uh, to develop a university research commercialisation scheme. I think everybody in the sector is waiting with bated breath for the outcomes of that, uh, but it's a clear signal that there is going to be increased focus on commercialisation across the university sector and from government. And we're also very grateful for the support of state level programs, uh, be it Breakthrough Victoria, the New South Wales R&D Action Plan, Advanced Queensland and their equivalents in other states, which contribute towards what is an incredibly supportive environment uh, to innovate and to build companies like the ones that we're building at IP Group. I'm very confident that what this will contribute to is a similar progression here in Australia and New Zealand to what we've seen in the UK over the last decade or more, which is the rapid expansion of opportunities from our leading universities, more and better quality uh, startup ideas and, and, and new companies that will create real impact. 
And to give you a sense of some of the innovations, and I won't talk through all of these, but some of the innovations that have come from our partner universities in Australia, uh, Gardasil, uh, which was developed by Ian Fraser and his team at the University of Queensland and, and later with CSO and Merck, uh, was the world's first vaccine against human papillomavirus. Uh, and this is one of the great advances in healthcare uh, over, the, over the last few decades. And it's estimated that it could save more than 60 million lives over the next 100 years. The other one that I'd flag on this side, on this slide, uh, is, is ResMed, who were, were core to the development of, of CPAP for sleep apnea, uh, which was developed in, in Sydney at, at UNSW uh, and is now grown substantially from, from, its, from those origins uh, and, and is now a $40 billion market cap company operating between Australia, uh, the US, and globally. Plenty of other examples, but I just wanted to give a sense that when, when we're building these companies, uh, we're building on a strong heritage and a strong tradition of creating world-changing companies from the research that is done at Australia's universities. To help us capitalise on this, we've built a world-class team of 12, uh, among which we have nine technical PhDs and broad experience across pharma, management consulting, biotech, clean tech and technology transfer. We're also very privileged to be supported by our steering group, chaired by John Akers, who is the former CEO of Woodside uh, and a director of CSL and the Reserve Bank. Uh, we have a group that has deep experience in networks across business investments and universities. Uh, if you couldn't see it, I've just been interrupted one of the perils of lockdown by my eight-year-old son. Uh, and particularly in that steering group, we'd like to call out Peter Hoy, who's a current vice chancellor of the University of Adelaide and I think Australia's longest serving vice chancellor. It is a real privilege to work with this team. Fourth element of the story is around capital markets. In Australia, we have one of the largest pools of retirement funds in the world, and we have uh, developed some, some relationships with key funds uh, among that group. With Host Plus, uh, we have the IP Group Host Plus Innovation Fund, which was announced in 2018 as a $100 million vehicle to invest alongside IP Group. Alongside Host Plus, we have a great relationship with Telstra Super, who are a significant shareholder in the group and are a big supporter of our activities here. These are great relationships which we look forward to growing and expanding upon over time. And finally, and this is the last slide you have from me, our portfolio. We're privileged to have invested in 13 companies alongside our university partners and the founding academic and commercial teams. I won't steal Paul and Zero's thunder, but what I can say is I'm incredibly excited every day to have the opportunity to work with these companies and excited to see the impact that they're already having on the world. They're backed by an equally exciting pipeline of new opportunities, which we look forward to sharing with you all as they come to life. We're talking about a few of our portfolio companies today, but just a quick plug, I'd encourage anyone who wants to, to learn more to join us for our portfolio showcase event next month, uh, where you'll have the opportunity to hear from the companies themselves. Look at our website or the PLC website for, for further information. Uh, and that's it for me. So I'd encourage you to post any questions you have, again, in the Q&A function uh, on Zoom and hand over now to Ciro Perez. Ciro heads up our life sciences team uh, and we'll talk through the themes in his portfolio and highlight two of the more advanced companies. Over to you, Ciro. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for uh, joining us today and giving us the opportunity to uh, present our portfolio here in Australia. Um, I would just start saying, sorry, I don't know if you can see me or... <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'll start saying that um, biotech is still a very young industry. Um, I would say if, if it was a generation, I'd probably would say it's a, a millennial with the first products um, born in the early 80s with recombinant proteins and first monoclonal antibodies and coming of age in the early 2000s where, um, with the sequencing of the uh, human genome. And um, over the last 20 years, we've seen really an introduction of many new technologies such as gene therapy, cell therapy, or RNA therapy, um, for example, that has been very useful for um, the current COVID pandemic, as, as you all know. And really over the last decade, we've seen an explosion of new drug modalities, we call that expand really what we can treat and allow us to treat a lot of uh, targets that were previously considered undruggable. And on top of that, we see that um, there's an 
merging a convergence of different disciplines as biology becomes more quantitative and, and design oriented. Um, we see emerging with information technology, with engineering disciplines in areas such as digital therapeutics, synthetic biology, or bionics. So we're trying to capitalize on here on, on these um, exponential trends, and we have kind of key three key themes. One is reverse disease and aging. This is targeting chronic diseases of high unmet need that are due to increase with the aging population around the world. And Australia is actually an excellent position on this area, such as chronic inflammation, fibrosis, or immunology. And recent Nature publication estimated that the value of such um, new developments to the world economy are over $7 trillion. Um, other key theme is, as I mentioned, new drug modalities. So these new technologies that allow us to go into that what was considered before the undruggable genome, which actually was 80% of all the genes in our body. And if you consider the current pharmaceutical industries, only that 20% that we've been able to treat so far, um, you could imagine this sector is, is, is due to explode as well. And we have here again, um, some companies in our portfolio even that have founders that have helped uh, develop some of these key technologies such as antisense oligonucleotides. And finally, the other theme is this biology and technology convergence. And we, where we see things such as bionics or, or things like a traditional in Australia, like cochlear developing those cochlear implants to help um, hearing impaired people. So we're really excited that the Opportunity really that Australia has proven to be that fertile ground we were hoping to find for new opportunities. And we've been working very closely with our partner universities and it's been incredible to, to work hand in hand to discover new, these new opportunities and create companies. And we've been investing across these key themes. For example, Kira Biotech, it's um, developing biologic therapies for immune tolerance, for transplantation and autoimmune disorders. In osteotherapeutics is, um, some, some small molecules that have been shown in, in animal models to reverse fibrosis, which is associated with about 40% of deaths, um, chronic uh, fibrosis of kidney and heart. Um, other companies, for example, Rage Biotech, that is applying antisense oligonucleotides, as I said, one of those new modalities to treat chronic inflammation. And um, other companies such as Jetra, which um, is engineering um, proteins to target obesity-related liver disease, which is a condition that affects, again, uh, over 60 million people in developing economies. In the merging of uh, biology and electronics, we, we have a, a great example with Alimetry that is developing wearable electronic diagnostics for gut disorders that affect, um, these disorders affect about 10%, 10 to 20% of the population. Um, and I'll tell a bit more about that later and also uh, bionics such as uh, augmented bionics that are doing non-invasive uh, neurostimulation for hearing loss. I'll now just tell a little bit more about a couple of our more advanced companies where you might hear news coming in the, in the coming time, in the coming months. So one of them is uh, Alimetry. This is out of the University of Auckland. We've invested together with Matu, another of the local VC funds in, in New Zealand. And as I said, Alimetry is targeting um, chronic uh, gastric symptoms that are between 10 to 20% of the population suffer through them. And the problem is currently they're very hard to diagnose. There's no good methods. So patients go through multiple rounds of doctor visits, fell diagnosis, unable to get the drugs or the uh, treatment that, that they need. And if you look at the gut, really it's, it's quite similar to the heart, but instead, there's a muscle that is pumping, but instead of pumping blood, it's, it's pushing the food down the tract. And um, you can see that this uh, in this video, how this muscle contracts and these waves that are created. And this muscle contraction can be measured on the electrical impulses. What the team realized is that using very sophisticated and sensitive electronics, they could pick up these signals from the surface of the body. And a lot of um, disorders are related to disruption, such as in the heart, you have dysrhythmias and, and other conditions. Here as well, you can see that problems with this muscular contraction lead to things such as 
nausea, vomiting, or, or pain. So the team developed this, um, this very kind of novel patch that you can wear on, on, on the stomach, and it will measure those electrical signals from the surface and be able to diagnose um, what's going on under the hood, as they say. Um, the technology is composed of four components, so an array, which is a single-use patch, a reader, which is enabled by Bluetooth that communicates with an app, and that is sent to the cloud where we can then apply machine learning and different uh, algorithms to this proprietary database of information to help us identify new uh, conditions and, and diagnose. And we're already seeing exciting results from this technology. This has never really been seen because there was not such a technology that made it possible. And what we can see is that we can already classify multiple, um, we call phenotypes, but multiple different behaviors of the gut. And that is kind of linked to what you would expect to see on, on different um, conditions. And really ultimately the goal is to um, change prescribing behavior and help patients by being able to prescribe to them the most relevant treatment option, which currently is more of a trial and error approach. So we're really excited to work with the Alimetry team. It's a world-class team. Um, Greg and Armin, the founders, have been able to attract a, an amazing team around them with a lot of medical device experience. And they're really kind of been executing since we invested at a very rapid pace, obtaining C mark and ISO 1545. And they're planning to launch um, in the US early next year. So you should hear uh, news from them. Stay tuned. Um, the other example I wanted to showcase is Kira Biotech. Um, they're developing precision immunology therapeutics for immune tolerance. This is an um, opportunity that we found um, from the University of Queensland and working together also with the ANSAC Research Institute in Sydney. And we've co-invested with other leading investors here, such as One Ventures and the Queensland Business Development Fund. And here the lead asset is um, we're trying to target um, conditions where the immune system has kind of gone haywire and starts attacking its own, your own body. And so this is a failure to tolerate your own tissue or transplanted organs, as in the case of transplantation. And this affects millions of people globally. Um, the lead asset of Kira is a, uh, an approach to tolerizing, we're, we're targeting dendritic cells. You could, you could think of dendritic cells as the sentinels of the immune system. They go around the body and scan for foreign tissue. And normally they're useful when they detect a virus or, or a bacteria that you want to eliminate, but sometimes they will recognize your own tissue as foreign, or they will recognize a transplanted organ as foreign and try to reject it. So they become activated and then they direct the rest of the immune system to, to reject that foreign object. So what the team found is that these activated genetic cells express this marker on the surface that is only expressed on these cells. And we have developed antibody that is able to recognize specifically this target. So when it binds this target, it eliminates these activated dendritic cells and induces tolerance and, and restores the normal functioning of the immune system. Um, the team is led by an amazing group of um, scientists and entrepreneurs. Um, Georgina was the founder and scientist behind uh, the Dendritic Cell Lab Biology in ANSAC Research Institute. And Dan Baker is former head of uh, immunology at Johnson Pharmaceuticals. And again, validates the interest of the opportunity that he chose to pick this opportunity out of um, the many international opportunities he found globally. And um, Helen Roberts is also a very experienced chief operating officer. Uh, as I said, we, we had invested in a round of $20 million back in 2019, and we've been progressing quickly. Uh, we're manufacturing currently the product here in Queensland, and we the goal is to enter first demand trials in early next year. So with that, um, I hope you will see many of these opportunities developing in our portfolio, and you will get news in the coming months, and I'll hand over to Paul. Hey, uh, th thanks everyone, thanks Mike, um, and uh, welcome everyone. Greetings from, from Sydney area. So, so like Cyril did, I I'd like to walk you through a few things in the physical science portfolio, as well as give a kind of a snapshot of some of the drivers behind some of our investments. So firstly, 
Um, some of the key themes that we're seeing in, in, in physical sciences that are driving a lot of our in, in investment opportunity. First one is around sustainable planet. And I think many of the listeners here today are, are really familiar with this global mission to take us towards net zero emissions by, by 2050. And that's probably underscored recently in the press by the, the COP26 conference uh, that, that's starting uh, next month in, in, in Glasgow. So, so sitting behind that are some really big uh, challenges and opportunities. Firstly, the challenges are a lot of the technologies needed to take us towards net zero don't exist today. And that creates a huge opportunity, not only as a parent to, to give back the planet in good shape to our kids and future generations, but also as an investor to have both an environmental and economic uh, impact. And Australia is kind of uniquely positioned in this area. Uh, as many of you know, Australia is kind of a sunny place. We've also got a lot of wind. So we've got abundant kind of renewable uh, resources. And you can juxtapose that with our mineral wealth. So Australia has incredible mineral wealth. And over the last, uh, um, probably earlier this, this century, there's been probably a little bit of friction between the green agenda and the, the mineral industry agenda. But that's really starting to sink up now here in Australia. And we're seeing deep commitment from all those big corporates to deeply decarbonize. And that's creating a lot of innovation and opportunity. And I'll, I'll give a snapshot of some of those in the portfolio uh, coming through in the next few slides. Uh, the, the, the next one is, is kind of bridging the digital physical divide. And, and today's Zoom conference is a really great example of this. I'm, I'm Zooming from Sydney area and probably uh, uh, we have several hundred people all over the world and, and we're, we're viewing each other and interacting with each other uh, relatively well. But uh, I think one of the amazing facts about the uh, digital physical divide is just she the sheer amount of data and devices that become part of our uh, everyday life. And that's growing exponentially and that exponential growth won't stop in our lifetimes. And that creates numerous um, uh, opportunities and, and challenges, probably too numerous to mention on, on this summary slide, but I just wanted to hit on two or three. The, the, the first one where all that data and connected devices is cybersecurity. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, headline stories about uh, organizations being hacked or infrastructure being, being, being taken over. That's because it's relatively easy compared to what, what it was in the past to, to access and craft a way into these uh, uh, networks and demand payment to free them up. And we're seeing some exciting opportunities in novel uh, kind of capital light technologies to, to address and, and secure uh, uh, networks and IoT devices in particular. And um, secondly, um, maybe as, as this uh, image in, 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 uh, talks about is, is there's a kind of a play towards robotics and augmented reality. And we're, we're seeing probably a lot of momentum towards smarter robotics or robots that can work beside humans in a, in a manufacturing line or e even in one's home. And we're seeing a lot of exciting opportunities emerging there. And, and, and finally, it, it does appear now is the age of 3D printing. So 3D printing has probably been around for, for 10 to 20 years, but it's really been a prototyping tool for the last decade. And we think there's there's kind of the seeds that that might translate to a, a true manufacturing technology in the uh, in, in the coming few years. So in our kind of sustainable planet portfolio, um, we, we currently have three companies and a pretty exciting pipeline of opportunities feeding in here. We've GrowWave, which is an ag tech company focused on herbicide free weed treatment. So reducing the chemical intensity of uh, food uh, uh, growing. And this company is getting tremendous traction both locally in Australia and with some major uh, horticulture growers in, in, in California. Uh, Hysada is, is a recent addition to our portfolio at the University of Wollongong. And this is around uh, hydrogen production or, or more specifically around electrolysis. So using green renewable electrons to make hydrogen. And this goes back to my earlier kind of mission statement around net zero. In 2050, 20% 20 of the world's energy system will be hydrogen. That's a pretty big number, and that's bigger than the gas industry is today, that the natural gas industry is today. So huge opportunity in, in, in hydrogen, and we're excited about 
this company and, and the portfolio or, or uh, other opportunities we're seeing emerging around them. And then uh, the last company is, is also a very cool and exciting company. It's, it's AMSL Aero, which is developing the Vertia, which I'll, I'll speak on shortly, but it's an EV tall, an electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, uh, vehicle, real dream uh, uh, project and company. Around our uh, bridging the physical divide portfolio, we, we currently have four companies and also a strong pipeline of, of opportunities. So we have Siamast, which is cybersecurity for IoT devices. So IoT devices are now prolific from CCTV cameras in factories through to the Alexa or Google home unit you have in your house. Those devices have really outstanding computational power, but they're agentless. They typically don't have any cybersecurity or antivirus software on them. So they can be seen as a bit of an Achilles heel into a computer network. So Siamast is selling into enterprises to basically shore up that uh, uh, weakness in their, in, in their network. PowerOn out in New Zealand is developing a, a next generation soft robotic hand. So imagine a robotic hand that has the dexterity of a human hand, has nerves on its fingers, has muscle that can grip and also has memory. So muscle memory, so it can figure out and recall what it's gripping. So we're, uh, and that company is getting a lot of traction with uh, big robotic companies in, in, in Germany. Additive Assurance is our company that's uh, focused on bringing 3D printing to the industrial age. And it's got a set of tools that can look at 3D printing in real time and quantify if, if you've built your, your um, part correctly. And this, this leads into almost an assurance, a quality certificate that would go with your part dur during its life. Canopus uh, Networks, I'll, uh, I'll just briefly skip over because that's actually my next uh, uh, slide. So uh, Canopus Networks, uh, I joined IP Group in uh, mid-2018, and this is our first physical science investment uh, in, in, in late 2018. And so we've really been partnering with this company for a number of years, and it's really starting to hit its stride, moving from the, the university lab, let's say, to a real formidable uh, company with, with strong commercial traction. And uh, I thought this company would be good to showcase on a day like today where we're using Zoom. And our Zoom experience so far, certainly for me, has been pretty good. There's been no dropouts. Audio seems, seems great. And this all relates to the information that flows through a telecommunication uh, network. And how we communicate and what we're doing is rapidly changing uh, as, and, and work from home has really, and, and, and COVID has underscored that, has really accelerated this change. This graphic at the bottom is representing a fiber optic cable with lots of data packets, lots of information flow uh, flowing through it, just like my image and voice is flowing through these networks all the way around the world. So what Canopus has developed is a software tool, so not a hardware tool, a software tool that's intrinsically inexpensive to examine and understand what's flowing through those telecommunication networks. So I like to think of these uh, fiber optics as pipes and, and Canopus enables you to look inside those pipes. And if you can look inside those pipes and know what's going on, there's, there's value for the operators of those pipes, which are the kind of telecommunication companies and the end users like, like you and I. So the telco companies like it because they know, if they know what's going on in their network, they know where to invest capital, they know areas in our network where the traffic's running a little bit slow and gives them a real toolbox to fix and, and, uh, and optimize their network. And then from a consumer standpoint, we end up with a better user experience, better connectivity, uh, a better Zoom experience, for instance. This, this company is deployed at uh, you know, multiple commercial scale sites and telcos across Australia and, and is going global. But I I thought it'd be fun to put up some metrics from pre-lockdown and, and this is pre-lockdown 2020, which seems a long time ago uh, and, and, and it was, right? And, and so what we, we looked at here was in, in a live deployment, the traffic change before lockdown and after lockdown and probably no surprises to anybody, huge growth in video traffic during that lockdown with the likes of Zoom and Teams really being the platform to for, for people to communicate and interact with. But interestingly enough, 
uh, they only account for 2% of the overall bandwidth. So, so chew up very little bandwidth, but are very latency sensitive. So if you're having any network jitters or issues, your, your video, your voice is probably going to drop out. And this presents a challenge for the telco networks, but also an opportunity for companies like Canopus that can help the telcos ensure that they're delivering a good experience to, to, their, to their customers. And the, the, the company, as I mentioned, is making really rapid progress. It's gone from a prototype to a fully deployed product. And it's signed up major uh, tier one carriers in Australia for a very lucrative kind of software as a service deal. So, so we're a software company. We sell a software solution to telcos and enterprises. And the, the, the financial model is you really charge around the number of users on the network. So, so a typical dollar price with that is it would be one to two dollars per year per internet user, which doesn't sound a lot of money. But if you look at it, uh, like one of the biggest telco um, telcos in Australia has about 10 million users. So that translates to quite a decent uh, uh, amount of revenue and clearly there's billions of users globally. So, so this is potentially a really lucrative opportunity. And that, that price I gave is just for that base baseline analytics I, I talked about, which is just looking inside the pipes and figuring what's going on. We've also got the ability to build a, a suite of technologies on top of that that can enable like a Zoom fast lane, a you know gaming fast lane, or, or uh, um, various other uh, product offerings. So the heartbeat behind this company has really been the team. And, and, and kind of like Ciro had mentioned in his portfolio, we've really built a superstar team around outstanding uh, founding scientists. So, so the founder, Vijay, is a professor out of UNSW who's taken a sabbatical to come work full-time for the company. And we've just built a powerhouse of technical and commercial talent around them that's, that's really translated this company into to gaining not only of an interesting technology, but really gaining traction with, with customers. And we think this one is really on a big um, uptick. To change gears uh, a little bit, um, I wanted to get into this EVTOL company. So EVTOL, again, is an electrical vertical takeoff and landing uh, technology. And this company, uh, AMSL Aero, is developing the Vertia, which is their version of EVTOL. And um, this is just such a cool project. I'm an engineer, right? You, you can't get anything more cool than a flying like car or electric flying uh, uh, VTOL. So this, this technology is cool on, on, on very many, many levels. But Vertia have developed a really unique approach. And, and, and they've got really two big differentiators. You can see in this diagram here, it's a box wing design. So think of those World War II, or sorry, World War I airplanes that had biplanes, two wings. That gives you really efficient lift. So you don't actually use a lot of energy in forward flight. And that efficiency translates to the lowest cost per kilometer. So this is a very inexpensive way of doing air travel. And I'll come back to that more in, in, in a moment. Secondly, the, the technology works on off the shelf batteries today. So, so think of the batteries that are in an electric car, like a Tesla, those same style lithium ion batteries slot into this uh, aircraft. And we can also use hydrogen and fuel cells to, to, to give us a bit of a range uh, extension. So bringing the graphic to life, this is uh, uh, this aircraft here is our full-scale prototype that the company's built and is commissioning. And this is gonna be test flying and hovering in the next several months. And that's our founder, Andrew Moore, a CEO sitting in the aircraft. And, and he's a unique uh, character, his background, is uh, he's an Aussie guy, grew up on a farm, flying from since he's been a teenager, joined the Navy, and then has been working in various a aircraft uh, companies in Australia, being kind of the lead engineer. And, and he really sought to reimagine how we built a VTOL, and that ended up with the, the Vertia. And uh, just thinking of what this Vertia could do, this is an Aussie map, but maybe I'll try and make this, bring this uh, some European context. So our batteries give us about 250 kilometers range and the hydrogen fuel cell version gives us about a thousand kilometer range. So if you're sitting in London, a thousand kilometers can take you to Frankfurt, Berlin, Paris or Milan, all in, in one of these aircraft. And these aircraft 
are small and nimble. So, so they fly at about 300 kilometers an hour, several hundred meters off the ground. They're, they're very safe and in fact, much safer than a, a helicopter because there's multiple layers of redundancy. As I mentioned, very um, efficient. They can be flown autonomously, but initially we'll have a, a, a pilot and, uh, and kind of a zero emission. If, if you get your electrons from a clean source, this can be a zero emission uh, source of uh, uh, transportation. So this company has an exciting uh, future ahead of it. And the first market it's going after is disrupting the helicopter market. So Australia has one of the biggest helicopter markets in the world. And some of the problems with helicopters is they're noisy and expensive and expensive to run um, and expensive to buy and not typically super safe. And Vertia as a veto really turns those problems on ahead. We've got, as shown in this slide, I'll just quickly summarize, really substantial savings in operational and, and functional cost. And, and, and so that's the market it's first going after is, is helicopter replacement. And we've got some really good relationships with aeromedical companies in Australia. So think of fitting out that small aircraft with like a stretcher and room for a, a medic as its first uh, market uh, segment. So you'd have this small nimble feet, fleet of electric aircraft to complement the existing uh, aeromedical uh, facilities. So moving on from that is regional transportation. So if you can imagine connecting uh, small cities together that have poor air or rail connections today, or even going from the outskirts of London to central London, um, or to one of the London airports relatively quickly. And then I think the longer term vision is really connecting those uh, um, you, you know, nice European cities, London to Paris and back comfortably in a day with, with, no, um, with no airport queues. And, and my final slide for today, I just wanted to give a teaser on this company, Hisata at the University of Wollongong. Again, this is my, our, our hydrogen company that's redefining the economics of hydrogen production. This company is currently in stealth mode and will be on stealthy in the next several months, but it's one we're really uh, excited about. We've got the world's highest efficiency electrolyzer. It's got a simplified balance of plant that enhances reliability and reduces capex. And we've started with a real focus on manufacturing and scalability. And actually today I was at their facility and we've hired a bunch of manufacturing engineers that are starting on coming up with the manufacturing methods for this technology. So, so real, real excitement to come, uh, not only in this company, but more broadly in the, in, in the portfolio. So I'd encourage you to add questions to the, the Q&A section. And with that, I'll, I'll hand back to Mike and Nadine to host the Q&A and, and, and wrap us up. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Ciro and Mike. So we've had, we've had some questions come through. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any other questions, keep, send, keep sending them to us through the Q&A function. Mike, I'm going to start with a question for you. Are Australian institutions supportive of IP commercialization? Thanks, thanks today. Uh, there's a short answer and a long answer. I think the short answer is yes. Uh, and, and that's whether those institutions are our, our university partners or some of the institutional investors here in Australia. I think there's, there's real support for commercialising the IP that is generated at our, at our universities uh, and seeking to get a greater dividend than, than we have previously from the, the, the 12 or $13 billion a year that is invested in, in research across our university sector here in Australia. So I think you know, there, there, is, there is a growing appetite and there's a growing awareness of the potential for returns. Uh, we'll play our part in that. Um, and, and I think it's gonna be a really good story for Australia and New Zealand over the next decade and beyond. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna give this next question to you, Paul. What impact has COVID had on the portfolio? Yeah, thanks, Nadine. I could say what impact it's had on me personally, uh, homeschooling kids, but let's uh, let, let's focus on the portfolio. I think many of us are in the same boat there. Um, 
I think Australia is certainly in 2020 weathered the storm really well and, and could use what were modest lockdowns last year to kind of plan effectively for this year. So it's had a pretty light uh, impact on the portfolio. They've all been uh, um, really operational and, and that company Canopus in particular was really able to capitalize on, on a big work from home initiative and, and sensitivity around network performance. So that got a lot of commercial traction. So, so, so no major impact uh, really at all. And Zero, question for you. What's the pipeline of opportunity like? How many opportunities do you turn down and what would be the ratio? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So I think the top universities, we work with eight universities here and one in Auckland, in, in, eight in Australia, one in Auckland. It's a lot of uh, new IP disclosures per year. I would say we're probably getting between life sciences and, and physical sciences, we get around 600 to 700 disclosures a year of which probably we will assess in more detail or in quite some detail about maybe 10 percent so about 50 or 60 maybe um opportunities and we end up investing in usually will be less than one percent of those so kind of on an average i would expect we do four to four or five investments um a year and i think we we work very closely together with our colleagues in uk and 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 the us so we we really kind of invest in only the, those that have a global opportunity and, and stack up against what we see in other countries. Great, thanks, Ciro. Uh, Mike, this will be a question for you. Australia is a long way from the UK. What makes these investment opportunities so special? Um, I'd say the UK is a long way from Australia. Nadine. Um, but I, I think we are very aware, and particularly at this time of, of year, of, of you know, the, the physical distance and, and the time zone uh, the distance that we have between our team here in Australia and, and the, the, the DRP group team in the UK. Um, and I think there's sort of some interesting, interesting observations in that. Uh, first thing I'd say is you know, Australia has always been and, and it is a long way away from, from a lot of the major global markets in the, in the US and Europe. I think that's changing uh, and we've seen a rebalancing of the global economy towards Asia uh, and you know, one of the things that I think we're very conscious of here in Australia is that, that we share a time zone with something like 50% of the world's population uh, and some of the fastest growing, growing markets uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and up in, in China, for example. And so, you know, it's a great place in Australia to be developing companies that are doing business uh, and, and exporting uh, into, into the same time zone. Um, and so I think that's, that's probably the first point I'd make on, on that question. I think the second one is that it really doesn't matter where you are increasingly in, in global technology companies. Uh, you know, we're seeing, and Paul talked to, to this a bit with Canopus, you know, we're seeing virtualization of, of work, we're seeing uh, remote work, uh, and, and we've seen certainly the ability of companies in Australia to, to engage with companies in the US or, or, or in Europe uh, virtually really increase over the last couple of years. And so I think one of the, the corollaries of that is that we're going to see and continue to see a market where great innovation uh, doesn't really matter where it's coming from. It's going to be able to be global from day one and to access markets uh, you know, wherever they are much more readily than perhaps we did a decade ago. Thank you. Uh, I've had a couple of questions come in, Paul, around the Vertia, uh, and they overlap a little, so I'm going to attempt to combine them into one question. There's a lot of excitement and um, some competitors in the EV toll space. So how can AMSL Aero keep up or overtake that competition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. good one, Nadine, and, and thanks, uh, uh, member of the audience, for the, for the question. So, so there, there is a lot of activity in this EV toll space, and, and when we looked at um, 
uh, AMSL first several years ago. That was one of our key questions. So we, we spent a lot of time in our due diligence on that one. So, so we believe that their kind of disruptive thesis is really around that efficiency of their aircraft uh, design, which, which enables this, this low cost per, per seat kilometer plus the ability to easily integrate the hydrogen fuel cell, giving a bit of fuel flexibility and, 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 and range. Um, and then so sort of building on top of that, what, what gives me confidence they can execute is the team. Like I talked a little bit about the founder, but there's, there's a lot of gray hair and experience on that, uh, particularly in the aeronautical engineering side of things. The really great team designing the product. And then there's, there's probably another quick three things I'd mention is, is there, path to flight and certification. So, so they've got really tight relationships with CASA, which is the Australian certification agency. And that's gonna enable us fast tracking uh, uh, kind of certification around flight. And uh, they've also got a really smart way of manufacturing the air, the, the fuselage, which is a composite. So, so all those, uh, maybe that doesn't answer the, the question completely, but all those things packaged together, I think gives us a, gives the AMSL era a pretty good shot at being differentiated from some of those big companies that are, or, or certainly those companies that have raised a lot of money. And, and so, so I think watch this space for, for, for Tia. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I think I'll give this one to you, Mike. What's the risk appetite like for IP commercialization in Australia from a capital markets perspective? Thanks, today. And, and look, that's a that, that's a really good question. Uh, and I've probably touched on a little bit in my in one of my previous answers, and probably a little bit in the in, in the presentation. Uh, I would say it is that there's certainly room for it to improve, uh, but I think we've got a, a really solid base uh, for of institutional support for what we're doing and what others are doing in this space in Australia, and that will continue to grow with results. So if I go back, for example, if I, if I were to go back a decade uh, to, 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 to the Australian and New Zealand environment after the global financial crisis, you know, there was a pretty well recognised shortage of, of risk capital uh, in the market and capital that was um, looking for, for exposure to, to venture and early stage commercialisation. And I think over the last decade, 12 years, uh, we've seen a real, a real transition uh, in, in Australian capital markets uh, and that's come from a couple of things. I think that's come from an increasing risk appetite that we've probably seen aspects of around the world. Uh, and I think it's also come off the back of the great results uh, and, and, and continued great results that we're seeing for commercialization of technology from our university partners and from, from elsewhere in the ecosystem. Probably the last comment I add to that is, is our lived experience uh, is that we're not seeing um, any shortage of interest or appetite to invest alongside us in our, in our portfolio companies, which is really what I think that question that, that question boils down to. Uh, we're seeing lots of appetite for the for the companies in our portfolio and and, uh, and for their prospects. Uh, I have another question that's come in, uh, Paul. This this will be following following your presentation earlier. Uh, you mentioned some of the opportunities that Canopus has. What are some of its challenges? I get all the hard questions here, Nadine. Uh, um, so, so, so Canopus has actually made rapid progress, uh, as I mentioned earlier, scaling from the lab to full commercial deployments. So it's got a commercial product in a commercial telecommunication network. That's great. Probably where it's had challenges over the last year and a half is getting commercial traction, which has been really identifying the value we can bring to the customer. But that kind of works behind us. And now we're really into kind of sales execution and using partners to go global. So I'd say commercially was the challenge, but we, we seem to have be exiting from that challenge and, and more into sales execution. Thank you. Uh, just looking at the time, I think we can probably squeeze one more in. Uh, so Mike, for the final question, IP Group Australia has been up and running now for four years. What can we expect to see over the next four years? Thanks, Anne. And, and I think that's a, that's a really good question. 
So, so if I look at the last four years and, and where we are today, I think what we've really demonstrated is that there is a great opportunity for us here in Australia and that we've, can, we've built out the team and built out the relationships and the, and the platform that enables us to execute on that. Uh, and it's really time for us to, to now to, to convert and deliver on that opportunity um, and, and to start to prove and, and demonstrate that the companies that we've got in the portfolio now and the companies that are in our pipeline at the moment can grow to be world-changing businesses and deliver that impact on the billion lives uh, that, there is, that is a key part of our ambition. And so, you know, if I were to, to look forward four years and, and you know, ask the same question then, uh, I think what we certainly aim to be able to, to, to point to is at least three of our companies that are, that are really starting to deliver that impact uh, and, and, and to change the world. And I think with what we've got in the portfolio today, we're very confident that we're going to be able to deliver that. Uh, and I think that'll be great for our peer group, that'll be great for the ecosystem, that'll be great for Australia. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully we can tell some great stories about it in four years' time. Look forward to that. That brings us to the end of our webinar. We hope you've enjoyed hearing about the exciting opportunities here in Australia. If you are interested in learning more about IP Group or would like to be involved in what we're doing here in Australia, please get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. Thank you again for your support and for joining us today for Dispatch from Down Under.